Hey, you guys ever notice that the big ornate pauldrons Ozai is wearing are actually two phoenixes? I didn't. Holy shit, how close is this thing to the ground? It's affecting the clouds? Like, just to compare with real life for a second, if that happened to us, there's no way this thing doesn't just collide with the ground and kill us all, right? We can take Azula. I'm not worried about her. I'm worried about Aang. Oh yeah, I forgot to mention this too. Do you guys think it sounds weird when Zuko calls Aang, you know, Aang? Because I could forgive you if so, since the first time he ever said his name was a few episodes ago in the Southern Raiders. She needs us, Aang. What am I holding? A cherry pit, princess. So this servant is also voiced by the same actress as Azula, which I think is kind of an interesting note. They could have got anyone to voice this girl, but they chose Grey Griffin. It might be some sort of commentary on how Azula blames herself for everything falling apart around her and sees herself as the problem, despite outwardly blaming everyone else. It's an interesting thought, but not really much more than that. Oh, and hey, we've actually seen this room before. Once again in Nightmares and Daydreams, Azula was getting her hair washed here. Wait, hold on. Am I supposed to take this like they just swam across, like, the ocean? P and Dow said this last episode. Nothing runs faster over land or swims quicker than a giant eel hound. But if you take into account where they were when they got the eel hound just inside the outer wall of Ba Sing Se, and where the Fire Nation air fleet is taking off from, that being the Fire Nation, and then you look at the map, I don't care how fast you are, how the fuck? We're too late! The fleet's already taking off! Then we're taking off too. Where's the closest airship? It's weird that Toph asks this and then totally starts doing her move before Sokka has a chance to point. This is a big gamble, man. She's got to get the right launch power and launch angle. Toph basically guesses and nails it. It looks cool, I guess, and it's a very Toph thing to do, so points for that. Also, I never noticed, but Toph does like a weird combat role to initiate this launch if you look at her behind Sokka and Suki. This is actually a very technically impressive shot when it comes down to it. You've got these 3D models acting within a 3D animated landscape, and it pulls back to do a pretty impressive camera move to show Ozai's ship and Ozai himself all in one one smooth motion. But then it focuses on Ozai who's now a 2D element within a mostly 3D animated shot, and it looks pretty seamless. The only thing that's a bit of a drawback is the frame rate on the airships, it's noticeably lower again, and it takes away from the shot a bit, but still overall it's pretty impressive. Ooh, I've got my problems with Azula in this finale, but damn the throne looks good in blue. It does raise a question though, we've seen a few times that our flames actually cool down to the normal orangey color if they set something on fire and are sustained, so it's interesting that the throne's flames stay blue without her maintaining them somehow. I think it's definitely worth it for the visual alone though. Another thing that's interesting to note is that the throne room seems significantly darker than usual despite there being just as much fire. She even has these torches lit on these pillars. Shit, it seems like it's almost darker than when Aang came in here and nothing was lit. Does blue fire produce less light? Is that a dumb question? Once again, it probably comes down to the storytelling aspect of the visuals though. Azula feels like she's alone now, so the only thing around her is her light. The rest of the room is dark. They find really cool ways to visually explain Azula's mental state, but I am still gonna have some issues to discuss about it here in a bit. Okay, how the fuck does everyone know this little knocking song? I know it, and I don't know how I know it. And everyone I've ever asked about it knows it, and they don't know how they know it. They've seemingly just always known it. Are we born with this knock in our heads? I mean, not to get into Avatar physics again or anything, but that would still have some effect on that metal, and I guess it wasn't sustained for that long, but shit, Toph could still cook alive in there. Toph actually gets a subtle little power increase here in this scene. This is the first time we ever see her manipulate metal without being in direct contact with it. Yes, okay, if you want to be a pedantic dick about it, she's standing in the airship, which is attached to all this other metal, but still. Before, we've only ever seen Toph metal bend things that she's been in direct contact with, as in hands-on. And maybe it's weird, but I kind of like that better. Like I've said, I like when powers have limitations that have to be played around with. And Toph having to literally muscle Metal into cooperating seemed like a really cool one that was in line with what metal bending really is. But it's the finale, you know? Turn everything up to 11. You gotta respect it on that level. <laughs> Whoa, an implied punch. That's the closest thing we've ever gotten to a punch. Wow, the battle damage on the floor here is actually really accurate to what just went down. Good job, show. Time to take control of the ship. Take the wheel. That's a great idea. Let the blind girl steer the giant airship. I was talking to Suki. That would make a lot more sense. Don't worry about it, Toph. The show was clearly communicating that he was talking to you there. I was confused too. Everyone please report to the bomb bay immediately for hot cakes and sweet cream. We have a very special birthday to celebrate. I love how everyone on this ship is like, well, we're trying to literally end the world here, but I mean, when it's your birthday, it's your birthday. We've actually seen these engineering outfits before. The workers on the drill had the same ones, or at least very similar ones to them. Gotta say, the Fire Nation doesn't have the best PPE protocol. I can't believe the captain remembered my birthday. He really does care. <laughs> In this shot, we can clearly see the crew that gets dropped out of the bomb bay, but there's also this other smaller group of people that get dropped out of somewhere further up towards the nose of the ship. We heard what happened. 
Why have you banished all your servants? All your Dai Li agents? And the Imperial Firebenders? None of them could be trusted. I'm gonna get into it, the mirror scene, all at once, it's coming. I'm gonna get flamed for it. We are concerned for you and your well-being. My father asked you to come here and talk to me, didn't he? Asked? That dude just named himself the fucking Phoenix King. I don't think he's in the business of asking for anything. You two must duel each other. I order you to fight an Agni Kai. But we're, we're not, not firebenders. firebenders. That's interesting, actually, because the first time we were ever introduced to Lo and Lee, they were commenting on Azula practicing throwing some lightning around. And apparently they are confirmed to be some sort of mentors in Azula's firebending training. That always seemed odd to me. I get that those who can't do teach, but if I was the princess of a nation and consumed with perfection, I'd want some teachers that can actually do the thing I'm trying to be the best at. Am I off base here? I like that the old masters are lined up in classic order here, that being fire, earth, water, sword. Only once every hundred years can a firebender experience this kind of of power. Iroh channeling the comet just by breathing in deeply is so perfect for what we've learned about Iroh and firebending. He said it himself, firebending comes from the breath. So him just breathing in here and summoning this huge ring of fire makes it feel even more like Iroh isn't just a master in the mental sense. He can walk the walk too. And I love that this comes full circle too. Iroh and his army sieged the wall of bossing Se for over 600 days and were repelled. But here Iroh is, back at the scene of his greatest military disgrace, and he kicks that fucking wall down in seconds. I feel like if you don't pay attention here, you don't really grasp the scale of this black last Iroh lets loose. Like, this is him over here. It's not quite as huge as the shit Ozai pulls later, but it might have gone to that size if the wall was further away. Good thing there's this conveniently placed basin of water here. <laughs> Zhang Zhang back at it with the firewalls again. I've said it before, but I just really like that some benders have these signature moves that only they do, and it just goes unstated. Like, no one talks about it, it's just how they do it, and I think that's sick. What a shame. You always had such beautiful hair. Okay, before we get into it, who the fuck animated Azula's face here? She goes through like five distinct emotions in only a few seconds. I'm always blown away whenever I watch this. All right, and now we get into it. Azula's mental collapse doesn't work for me. It's just simply too fast. We don't get enough screen time to see her descent from this perfect, plotting, conniving badass to total wreck. I agree, it's a novel way to take a villain. You don't see this kind of thing very often at all, but that doesn't mean they did it well. Throughout season two and three, before the betrayal of Mei and Tai Li, we see Azula as this unstoppable, incredible force. She's an awesome physical threat, yes, but mentally she was a bulwark too. She emotionally manipulates, she plots, she plays mind games, fuck, she even takes losses in stride. The only hint at a crack in the armor in all of book two was actually in the first episode. Almost isn't good enough. This gives the idea that she's very demanding on herself, hard on herself, but it's one moment in one scene from two seasons ago. After that, Azula is perfect, too perfect. She doesn't know how to socialize with other kids, and it's clear she does put some stake in that at least, but she's princess of the Fire Nation and maybe the most dangerous lady on the planet, and it's clear that she likes being those things and cares about that more. So when Azula starts completely collapsing when her friends who, by the way, seemingly haven't been around for a long time prior to the show, betray her, it seems weak to me. She's got one scene in the Southern Raiders where she seemed a little more animated than usual, and now we're suddenly supposed to buy that this Machiavellian schemer is completely shattered? It's too quick, man. And yes, there's value in reading between the lines and subtext, but with the show having been out for as long as it has been, like with a lot of other things in this show, the fans do the legwork in their heads for the story shortcomings. And then there's the line where she says her dad can't treat her like Zuko as well, which I think perfectly encapsulates what went wrong with Azula's fall for me. That's the first time we ever hear her bring something up even close to that. Does she worry about things like that? Are those thoughts in the back of her head? We don't know because the story didn't take time to educate us. And then there's the stuff with her mom, to which before this, the only context we have is Zuko's perhaps skewed memories and one moment where she mentioned it and kind of laughed it off. Now, if that's the linchpin in her fall to madness, just ask yourself if you're disagreeing with me right now. Do you think that's enough from a storytelling standpoint? And you might, but for me, if it all comes back to that, which is what the show was telling us at the moment, it had to be talked about more for it to be effective. It's a story. If it's gonna have a big moment like this, it has to be properly built up to. And not just having fans saying, Ozai must have put so much pressure on her, or oh, she's only 15. That's not the story being told. That's not the point for the viewer to have to rationalize it more in their head after the fact. If they had the betrayal of her friends sooner somehow, or a couple more times where she brought her mom up, and really gave her some more scenes of her starting to crack in the episodes prior to the finale, I think this could have potentially worked. But now we're in the finale. This is it, and they haven't fit Azula's storyline into the rest of the story organically. So now, inversely, I think Azula takes up too much time of the finale, because they have to rush all of her story in. We're having this scene right now, and there's half an hour of Avatar The Last Airbender left. Not enough substance, and too rushed. That's why the extremely expedited complete mental collapse of Azula trademark rejected doesn't work for me. Woo! Okay, moving on. In this shot, you can see the hijacked airship down closer to the water.
I think this little moment is so cool, dude. Just Ozai sort of gauging, maybe even struggling against the force he's able to output now. And his hand bobs back and forth with some effort. It just makes it feel like, oh man, there's some kick behind this shit, even before you see the giant plume of fire. Wait, hold on. You're telling me Ozai is a pigeon bender too? I can't believe we're seeing common enhanced pigeon bending. Holy shit, I know I said Boomy had the most precise use of bending in the whole show a while ago, but this is giving it a run for its money. Ang snipes these things three for three from like five miles away. And I do like that Ang starts off this interaction with earth bending and then fire bending, the styles he definitely struggled with the most. It's like, yeah, I'm fucking ready, baby. I got everything on lock. I'm firing on all cylinders. You ever notice that the big Ozai versus Ang fight doesn't start until after the second commercial break in the second to last episode? I feel like it starts earlier, and I feel like it should. Once again in this shot, you can see the airship fleet, including the hijacked one way out in front. This fight starts out so purposefully different than any other fight we've seen in the show. We've never seen a firebender do a shockwave move like this, and we've never seen an earthbender do this weird maneuver Ang goes for. It's amazing that they still have new ways to keep the magic system feeling fresh. And using two moves that we've never seen before to start off this fight is definitely there to make it stand out. Go away! Slice. Should go without saying to all you fledgling overanalyzers out there, but this isn't the first time we hear Sokka say airbending slice. A little... Airbending slice! He said it back in Avatar Day too, so Sokka's grand plan here is sort of based off a weird nothing line from this weird nothing episode. Airship slice! You ever hear that thing, possible myth, that blind people can actually see like a dot or something if they look at the sun? For a long time, I thought that was what this moment was going for, but it's probably more like Toph can just feel the heat, which is also cool. I've heard people flame this episode for Sokka being able to fly this airship at all. But if you think for a second, they hijacked a Zeppelin just like this one when they were leaving the Boiling Rock. And I don't think it's much like Sokka to not take an interest in learning how to fly it on the way back to the Western Air Temple. Watch each other's backs, and if we make it that far, I'll let you know. Sokka, we don't have time for this! Okay, this one's pretty incredible. In Ozai's original air fleet, there were 16 ships, including his own one way out in front. So subtract that one and the one Sokka hijacks, and we're down to 14. As the airship slice commences, we see it hit 5, so that brings us down to 9 total enemy airships left in the sky. Then, in the next shot, if you keep listening, you can hear it make two more collisions before it begins to fall apart. <laughs> then we see it hit four more in this next shot, and if you keep listening, it hits two more here, the second impact being the one that separates Suki from Sokka and Top. <laughs> Finally, we send the nose of the hijack ship craning into one final blimp, and yep, that's 14 for 14. That's awesome that they account for every single one, even if we didn't see them all. Another weird thing that I personally always thought was that Toph started running the wrong way here for some reason, and Sokka had to pull her in the right direction. But that doesn't make any sense, since Toph should be able to see just fine. But it turns out what actually happens is that Toph begins to slip, and Sokka grabs her. Sokka's actually super protective over Toph this entire mission, and it's never really pointed out or focused on, but I think it's a really nice touch. Hello? Zuko here. Just prior in this scene, Azula was sharing the stage with only five fire sages, but now there's seven just chilling. Even you admitted to your uncle that you would need help facing Azula. There's something off about her. I can't explain it, but she's slipping. You can't explain it? Look at her. I feel like anyone with a brain can tell she's fucking deranged, Zuko. It's like looking at a rhino and saying, for some reason, I think that thing has a big horn on its face. In this establishing shot of the arena, we can see Katara's up here in the stands, which means she had to run all the way down here and out onto the battlefield to have things go down the way they did. I'm sorry it has to end this way, brother. No, you're not. Despite my problems with how Azula was handled, I still do think this is a sad situation. I'll talk about it in a minute. I really like that Ozai still has to commit a lot of his energy to actually staying flying. He actually bobs up and down and has to kick himself back up and account for the momentum he already has a lot of the time. It helps add a sense of weight to the fight that I always think is super important. I think the simple fact that there's gravity that characters have to account for adds a lot of interest to fight scenes, even if they're mostly grounded. So I'm a big fan that Ozai doesn't just fly around like a Dragon Ball Z character despite this battle being so high flying compared to the rest of the series. Also, just the sound design on these really big blasts of fire. I don't even really know what to call that sound, but it really adds a sense of power and danger. 
Aang actually uses rock armor here for the second time, making it one of his most used earthbending techniques, learned originally from Toph, which once again helps this fight feel like Aang's training has really paid off. It hits everything really well, a mix of brand new moves and moves like this that help us remember that Aang didn't do it alone, he had help. This one has always bugged me. Ozai's lightning just stops here after a short distance. Now I'm no fucking lightning doctor, but my brain really wants it to hit something and not just go away. I guess that raises the question of what happens to lightning that we've seen shot off screen. And I don't have an answer to that, but I know my dumb ape brain just doesn't want it to end randomly. I think regardless of how this fight hashes out, Aang refusing to redirect the lightning back at Ozai is a good move. It helps enforce Aang's reluctance to kill, as well as basically taking lightning off the table for Ozai, so it just doesn't turn into a lightning throwing fest. Which it probably would have realistically if Aang didn't show he had an answer for it. I think this moment is really cool too. There's that myth that if you hit the water from really high up, it's like hitting cement, which don't get me wrong, hitting water from super high up will still fuck you up. But it's just cool that Aang has an understanding of that and actually uses water bending to kind of meet him and cradle him instead of just crashing into the water. Shit, I'm finding that I actually like a lot of stuff about this fight. I might like it more than I thought, actually. Footscar continuity, the lighting makes it hard to see, but it's there. Okay, so this fight goes down as a highlight for the entire series, and for good reason. The visuals are stunning and the score is powerful. They chose to go with a very somber song because it's a sad situation. Brother pitted against sister, in the end just because their family's a mess. It's not something to be celebrated that Zuko and Azula are fighting seemingly to the death for the throne. It's a very dour set of circumstances, so I think the show takes a very fitting tone. And the visuals, of course, they're incredible. This entire fight is a visual and emotional triumph. <laughs> And now I'm going to talk about Zuko's signature move too, because for some reason I haven't yet. Zuko does this b-boy style spinning kick a few times throughout the show, so that goes down as his move. I love the comparison of Azula and Zuko's breathing here. Once again, we've been told firebending comes from the breath. <sighs> Azula's is very labored, and she's obviously not in a good state emotionally, so that probably plays into that. But as Zuko squares up to redirect the lightning, it's one deep breath, centered, focused. <laughs> They did not deserve to exist in this world, in my world. Prepare to join them. Prepare to die. And wow, what a cliffhanger too. Two awesome bleak notes to leave the second to last episode on. This episode is a tour de force. Everything is firing just right. Everything. Well, mostly everything. It's all been paced out perfectly to hit all the crescendos at the exact right moments. Sokka, Toff, and Suki's mission, which could have easily fallen to the wayside as the least interesting, takes a crazy turn as they do this ridiculous, reckless plan. Bossing Sing being recaptured. Zuko versus Azula has been built up for two seasons. Aang versus Oza has been built up too for the entire show. Everything is working. Everything melds so beautifully together, especially the visuals and music. Azula gets too much screen time for my taste, but I've already been over that. This episode is a defining 20 minute stretch in the legacy that Avatar left behind, and I don't say that lightly. Patreon shoutouts if you want to see the finale of Overanalyzing Avatar and see the video that comes next after that, you can support me on Patreon for just a few bucks. Link, as always, is in the description below the video. Biggest shoutouts of all go to my top patrons Agent Rhino, who can broadcast their thoughts to all other vertebrates, Ben Mizra, whose chest hair can cure a wide variety of known ailments, Bram G, who's been abducted by four different aliens species, totally removed from one another. Brendan Murphy, who paved most of the roads on the west coast by himself in around a year. Donnie Snow, who can actually look into a crystal ball and see the future, but only ant futures. Dylan Calvo, who was once the tallest person to ever live, but donated more than half his height to charity. Garrett Kane, who was a being of pure attractive energy stuffed into the most attractive meat sack they could find. Honor and Cultivation, who got a haircut that was so good they invented a Nobel Prize for it and then gave it to them. Inflation Fairy, who dropped a coin off the Empire State Building and caught it before it hit the ground. Jake the Rake, who could teleport into any ventilator system in the world. It's kind of a pain to get out of it though. Jerry Craft, who gets proportionally stronger the closer they are to the Red Sea. Caitlin, who trapped a real god in a magnetic trap and has mostly been using it to go pick up her groceries. Kennedy Stapleton, who rides around on a crab the size of a minivan. Leif Earn Hammer, who trained a tiger to hunt with a gun. Lou Carrera, who is the only human that can photosynthesize. Michael Runke, who can play an entire orchestral movement by himself and even conduct it too. Nostalgic Games, who ran so fast once the weather forecast got two degrees hotter. Nick Kapainen, who's never hit a red light. They're always green for him 
weirdly. Omega Fighter, who screams can kill the weak. Philly Days, who cracked a diamond by staring at it so hard. Skylos, who tries to keep his eldritch tentacles a secret, but I know about them. Sky Strider, who, you know the clapper, where you can turn the light on or off by clapping? Well, he can do that with people's brains. Stephanie Riches, who's the last person you'd think would own a constantly flaming battle axe, but here we are. Tiago Nascimento, who played the Grim Reaper in a game of one-on-one -on -one basketball and broke his ankle, so now he gets to live an extra 10 years. Varunda, who sleeps well knowing that no one will ever find out about his extra-dimensional origin story. Whitrow, who can tune into radio signals by raising their hands up like an antenna. Will Schneider, who was gonna replace the bulls in bullfighting, but everyone figured it was too dangerous for the matadors. Wolf Mandan, who has come back from the dead in three totally separate and distinct ways. And Zoopy, who limboed under an 18-wheeler that was driving 60 miles an hour. Even more huge shoutouts go to my other top patrons, Burb, Blade Typhoon, Caesar's Ghost, Costco94, Danger Stranger, Daniel Ward, Emperor Tromedlov Dromoy, Eric Barney, etc., Finnish Blood, Fritz Sullivan, Grayson Webster, Harrison Poland, Jared Berkman, John, Kevin Hall, Literal NASA Rocket Scientist, Mandatory Sin, Misha Boblov, Muting, Nopetron, Pran of Prem, Random Curry, Sean Martin, Siviactor, The Sinking Bubble, Thomas Lautenbach, and You Frickin' Nerd. And of course, my god overanalyzers, Active Sloth, Alex Fritz, Alan Garvin, Ali QPZM, Andrew Watchett, Austin Gallup, Be My Valentine, Big Thirsty, Braden Shanahan, Brando Espinosa, Brand Muffin, Cade Stinson, Caleb Fosna, Cameron Osola, Canine Corpse, Charles Barnett, Charlie Bronkowski, Chloe Benton, Connor Doman, Dan Bertel, David Carlisle, DJ Jax, Do Mutual A, Dominic Saint, Distant, Earth 2 John, Edge La Chief, Eleanor Rose, Excited Face, Fingal Kern, Flex Short B, Gennaro, Greg Warlardi, Il Gerardo, Isaiah Wilson, It's Carton, Jacob Whitecotton, Jake the Garden Rake, Jaziel Martinez, Jackson, Jay Lambo, Jimbo, John Ajaka, Jot Moreland, Joshua Bone, Josie Tiffany, Justin Fletchall, Justin Scott, Justin Moore, Kate and Connor Prendergast, Kadex, Kazuto Kirigaya, Keon Gilliland, KT and Den B, Lady Serena, Lehman Russ, Life Before Death, Madison McCone, Mario, Matthew Stargell, Medium D Speaks, Mayor Timmel, Michael Conrad, Michael Springle, Mike is Cool 88, Mitchell Gobrecht, Mortius 007, Nathan William Sizemore, Nickel Pickle 582, Nicholas Abbott, Noah W. Chetlet, Omar, Ori, Papa Jaka, Parker Gas, Parker P, Philip Conti, Purple Danielle, Quinton, Radiator Rat, Ranga, Riley Booth, Rocket Miss, Ryan Maxwell, Sakote, Samuel Graves, Shadow Fox Nero, Sky Not Darkened, Sophie Kitty, Spory, Stab Dog, Stefan Isle, Steinwan, Sunline, Super Salad 726, Super Snipper, Taryn Solis, The Alternist, The Flowey 27, The Hardys 01, Timothy Buzelli, Travis Chestnut, Triad Juice, Two Loaves of Bread, Vavina Lockfire, Wilbur Bass Boosted, William Willette, Wool, Wyatt Pence, Zancrim, Ya Boy Mike, and Zatchaholism. Next up is Avatar Ang. We did it. We're finally here.